daisy chains Can't seem to recall My true given name I see my footprints How they come, how they go Was that yesterday? Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 54. No, Dave. There's oh, no we Dave. were all waiting for the 54. Jordan, I thought you were going to do it, actually. 54. Thank you. I felt hey, actually, that, was, that was like a movie that was, in that, that was good. 54. That was good. I'm not even using my compressor, man. If I use the compressor, it's going to be like legit. I didn't want to scare you guys, though. So. <laughs> we want to be scared. It's early in the morning. We are easily scared. Yes. yes. Yeah, we're, uh, Michelle scares me, and she's like five foot zero and weighs forty pounds. I'm actually five foot seven and weigh a buck twenty, but yeah. Well, I was close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was close. You know. Okay. And and your mom still probably says you look fat every time you. <laughs> no, <go." laughs> no, my mom's one of those you need to eat kind of. Oh, moms. really? Because oh, the, yeah, there's two kinds yeah. of Asian moms. Yeah, there's you look yeah. fat, and there's you need to eat. Yeah, no, my mom is definitely one of those. Let me make you a sandwich. She she <laughs> actually should have been an old Italian mom. Yeah, it sounds like it. The thing is, <laughs> if you eat that sandwich, she's going to be like, "Now you look fat." <laughs> <laughs> have you met my mom? You probably have. I got I got Chinese almost in laws going on over here. So nice. So you know the deal. The thing yeah. with uh, Michelle is she doesn't gain weight. Ever. Like, like literally, like that's a medical condition she has. She can't gain weight. <laughs> he wishes it was a medical condition. <laughs> it, it's ridiculous because no, I've seen her eat, and then I just watch and I gain weight, and <laughs> she and she loses weight. Yeah, you're, you're like, thanks a lot for eating that burger last week, Michelle. My resting heart rate just went yeah. up at like yeah. 10 p.m. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really ridiculous. It really it's, is. It's tragic. It's tragic. It is. So I feel funny. bad about it. Anyhow. On to more important things like our panel, which uh, now everyone knows is Michelle and Jordan. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. It's uh, 8 a.m. on the West Coast, you know, nice yes. and early. It's really <laughs> early. But th- but this just shows a devotion of you two. True. Well, at least yeah. Jordan. I mean, I pay Michelle to be here, so. Yeah, right. I was going to say, that's not a devotion. That's just a paycheck on my part. Paycheck. You can pay me if you want as well. I don't have no, a problem. No, thanks. No, no, it's okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I want to feel like someone loves me just because they love me, not because I pay them to love me. I come here. I come here for the guests. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ouch. Okay. So moving on quickly. <laughs> hey, what do we got going on, Michelle? We got a ton of stuff going on. Um, uh, we just hired a new employee. We did. We, we did. An like to... Another well, Michelle, because I yep. didn't think one was enough. Another brunette Michelle. Yep. Michelle Bosch, our new salesperson. Oh, wow. She's actually a Michelle. That's yeah. kind of funny. She's actually okay. a Michelle. She really is, yeah. Uh, we had to come up with a nickname for her. So her Hawaiian name is Mika. So that's what we're calling her. Because, you know, we, we work virtually and we have these virtual meetings. And then I say things like, hey, Michelle, and nobody knows who you're talking to. And then you get it in stereo, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. We got Mika and Michelle, but she's our new um, chief business stimulator or chief of BS. That's what we're calling her. Um, working for us now, so she's brand new, so we're happy to have her aboard. Uh, our Orlando class is just about full. That's next week, yep. Michelle. Yep. Orlando, Thank we're getting goodness. out of the snow. Sunny Orlando. We are going to sunny Orlando and getting out of this ridiculously cold weather. I'm looking out at eight inches of snow out my window right now. So I am happy. Wow, I'm, that sucks. Yep, it does. I am happy to be in Orlando. But then we're going to uh, Dublin, Ireland. What, May? Me, yep. And then we knew last podcast, we got accepted to Black Hat, so we'll be out there in August. Oh, wow, Sunny good. Las Vegas, yes. Can't wait for that. And then we are finishing the year off in Baltimore, right on the harbor. Right on the harbor. It doesn't happen in November, so we got our four classes out there. The day this podcast comes out, my book is being released. Woohoo! Yeah, I'm excited. I am very excited, even though I might not sound it, but I am. I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm so excited for the release of no, my book. I am, I'm telling you, I am tired. That book took it out of me. It was like two years in the working and literally ten straight months of writing after researching everything for two years. So, Wow. Yeah, yeah it was, it's a pretty heavy book. You know, it was uh, um, Ekman, Dr. Ekman was my, um, my editor and his guy, uh, Paul Kelly, were my editors. So I didn't. I had no room for error. 
Uh, there was a couple times I said some things that were not scientifically accurate, and I got the smackdown and had yeah. to rewrite chapters and stuff. So, um, uh, but that made me happy in the end. I was very happy with that kind of outcome because I knew that it was going to be released as something solid. Yeah, now no one can be like, ah, this is dubious, because right. it's like, no, it's all, like, cited and everything. Yep. Is that, like, your worst insult, Jordan? This is dubious. This is dubious. <laughs> well, you know, he, I think he was being good because he was PGing it for me. This is uncredentialed. <laughs> no, don't ever say that. that I was, you, you're you're like, I said PG! <laughs> <laughs> Not uncredentialed. That's a 15-letter word. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other big news, DEF CON. We are back again for DEF CON 22. Michelle is so happy that yeah. I think we're going to hear a scream of happiness right now. Yes, I'm slitting my wrist in the bathtub as we speak. <laughs> we have our social engineering capture the flag and our social engineering capture the flag for kids. And we are excited. We are excited. We are excited. Because this year, we got some big changes. I'm not even going to go into it yet, but big, big, big. You're going to love it. We're and hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have the sign-up sheet yep, on the page of the dot we'll org. Going. Yep. And uh, by March, we'll have it up and ready, and then we're going to really be organizing this year. This is going to be a phenomenal year for the SECTF. And I must say, uh, from last year, this last year was our best year at companies reaching out to us to ask for the data and for advice. Um, I will say almost every company that we uh, used as a target in the CTF reached out to us in a very professional manner asking for the details and how they can use it to protect their their company. So uh, pretty excited about that actually. It's been the best year for that so far. So we're hoping 22 is just as good. Okay, let's see what do we got. Well, I gotta just mention our opening song. Everyone keeps asking about it's Gone Cold from Clutch. If you love that, you can check them out at pro-rock.com. We're happy with those guys letting us use that song for our intro music and our outro music. Um, you can check out their other stuff on that site too. So our guest is Chris Dufour. That really is his name, Dufour. If you can believe that. Um, so we over the last year we developed a nice uh, small list of partners, companies that we partner with, like like Dave's company, uh, Trusted Sec. Uh, but uh, Dufour works with a company called White Canvas, uh, White Canvas Group, and they are social media experts. So over the last year working with them, we have been able to see them do some just phenomenal things with social media, um, how they track social media usage around the globe. And we thought, what a better topic, uh, considering the last 18 months or so, all the attacks that have been going on, many of them linked to social engineering, and of course starting with uh, doxing people through social media. We thought this would be a great opportunity to talk to them and uh, get some insight into how social media is used and what they're doing with it and how they're tracking. So we're going to get Dufour on now. So we welcome our guest, Chris Dufour, with us from White Canvas Group. Chris, nice to have you with us this morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, sir. So probably the big question everyone's got is, tell us a little bit about White Canvas, first of all. What is White Canvas? Uh, well, White Canvas Group is a technology and training firm. We're located in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, uh, two of our co-founders, Tim Newberry and John Idonacy, uh, uh, started the company back in 2008. They're both uh, former, former Naval Academy grads. Uh, they've done some amazing things both in and outside of government. But uh, essentially the, the, the reason why they became a private entity was because they had all these insane skills in technology and training, particularly from the perspective of using innovative online technologies to influence people to do stuff uh, or to research uh, certain audiences online and draw uh, interesting conclusions about those audiences and perhaps you know uh, get get to a little bit more detail on what motivates those audiences and then kind of uh, figuring out how we can build technology on top of those findings or those processes and methodologies. So uh, that's really kind of what we do today is, is, uh, is half a side of the fence is, is training folks to understand those nuances online, how people behave online versus how they behave offline and, and then building technology on top of some of those insights and, uh, and trying to do fun stuff with it. Yes, and that kind of explains like how we partnered up because I mean, just your defin you know, your definition at first of looking at, how people are influenced by social media. This is a big deal for us as uh, social engineers. So can you give an example of that? Like what, 
maybe there was a public case or something that you looked at that could indicate how social media affected the public or affected people? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So we um, uh, uh, remember when The Dark Knight Rises came out and there was that big, uh, uh, right around the same time, there was the Aurora, Colorado shooting yeah. in the theater, right? Um, so so we, were, we were paying attention to the run-up to the release of The Dark Knight Rises using a tool that we've developed called VizSense. And it's, uh, VizSense is, a, is a, a video tracking tool. And essentially what we were doing for, for a couple of clients were trying to, trying to quantify the online sentiment uh, of the buzz leading up to the release of, of The Dark Knight Rises. Um, so when Aurora, Colorado happened, uh, all of a sudden, there was, there, you know, prior to Aurora happening, there was this tons of just positive sentiment. Everyone was so excited about Batman coming out, and it's the third movie, and 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 there was lots of positive sentiment. But after Aurora happened, uh, we noticed this huge uh, downturn in sentiment uh, online. And what what it was was not not something really that 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 uh, an algorithm or a computer program or a tool. Uh, can can pick up on but the, but essentially what was happening is online the sentiment was was conflating dark knight rises with aurora colorado shooting so anytime someone searched online for uh hey tell me a little bit about dark knight rises what they were finding were youtube videos of people talking about this horrific tragedy uh and as and as a result people were beginning to think that the movie was actually a bad movie uh, because it was it was informing like all those ag algorithms were kind of informing maybe a Rotten Tomatoes score or other things that that were kind of autom automatically assessing online sentiment and saying that oh actual humans are thinking that the movie is bad. Well, no, that wasn't the case. The case was people were just people were just really sad about this horrific tragedy that happened that happened to happen during a Dark Knight Rises premiere. So was that just related to Dark Knight Rises, the 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 downturn, or was it all movies because of that? No, it was it was specifically for Dark Knight Rises because wow. uh, the the way that we were looking at it, uh, and, and of course the shooting happened during uh, a screening of Dark Knight Rises. Right. So anytime anytime someone was talking about it online on a social media uh, net, on a social network someplace or in uh, in a traditional media outlet online, maybe they were they were mentioning. Dark Knight Rises in conjunction with Aurora, Colorado, tragedy, shooting, uh, X number of people dead. And as a result, all of those, those online keywords uh, were beginning to attach themselves. Those negative online keywords like kill, murder, death were being, beginning to get attached to Dark Knight Rises. And, and what that created was... Uh, kind of a kind of a false positive search engine op optimization. So when people were looking into, uh, you know, should I go see The Dark Knight Rises? They were getting all of this content about um, the shooting, and as a result, you know, we're, the, the the theater turnouts weren't as big. If you noticed, right after that happened, uh, that that event happened, um, Christian Bale showed up in Aurora, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually kind of hung out with some of the, the survivors in the hospitals. That was a, a very deliberate move on the part of uh, of everyone behind that movie to kind of kind of get away from that negative downturn in sentiment that happened online. So was that done, uh, do, do you think or do you know, was that done with Christian Bale just because of, of the way that the online sentiment was being affected by social media? I think that was definitely one of the major concerns in the decision to kind of make that happen. I mean, I mean, ultimately, you know, Christian Bale seems like a good guy, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, in, you know, he wanted to do it anyway. But the 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 rationale behind the studio actually kind of getting behind, okay, what can we do as a as an organization, as a studio, as filmmakers and actors and crew and whatever to to you know alleviate this this terrible event that happened. I'm I'm sure. They they twigged onto it a lot quicker by seeing that sentiment uh, expressed online than they would have if if uh, they weren't paying attention to it. So is this similar? Like I know when um, when the AP's Twitter account got hacked, and then there was that tweet about the White House being bombed and Obama being injured. Oh uh, that actually affected the stock market. Yeah, um, it's it's exactly the same thing. Um, the thing about sentiment is that it's notoriously difficult to measure online. Yeah. Um, it's it's really difficult for a computer program to say, uh, you know, this means this and that means that uh, when it comes to sentiment. And the, and the reason that is is because humans are the only only entities online that can add context 
uh, to certain combinations of words. Uh, so, so that was one of the reasons why that particular um, the the the, uh, the Syrian Electronic Army hack of the AP Twitter uh, Twitter account that led to that stock market crash. That's why that happened. Uh, high frequency trading algorithms that the Nasdaq and the stock market were using at the time were plugged into Twitter, and there were sentiment analysis engines on the back end of that that were feeding stock values. So those those analytics were looking for changes in sentiment regarding certain keywords. So when they heard from a reputable source, which was the AP, the at AP Twitter account, saying that the White House was uh, under attack and that the president was uh, was down, that that they the, the analytic, even though that was an untrue statement, uh, the analytics said, this is a big deal. We're going to devalue all the stocks. And that's why there was that $200 billion loss. So how, how do you do it then? How, how do you create a program then that can actually um, take those results and measure them in a quantifiable way? Um, I think, uh, you know, I don't know that you can get 100% there. Uh, you know, and, the, and, and I say that as somebody having used quite a few commercial off-the-shelf analytics for social media sentiment, social media analysis, and, and research. Um, I think everyone has its interesting ways of going about doing things. Um, but at the end of the day, really, the, the, the only way that you get good at understanding social media data is by being an analyst and by being a, a really good uh, you know, human analyst that's augmented by tools that, that maybe you know, get you... 10% or 20% or 30% of the way towards making an assumption about uh, things. You know, in, 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 the, in the sentiment thing in particular, uh, let's say you have an example of you're trying to make sense of do people like the Patriots online? Uh, are, they, are they expressing sentiment about the Patriots in one way or another? Well, if you rely solely on any one of the, the, the hundreds of different social media analytics tools that are out there right now, um, if, if they're looking at a series of tweets that say something like the Patriots are the shit, um, they're going to say, well, that's a negative sentiment because they're looking at shit as a negative word and not it within the context of that sentence, the Patriots are the shit, is actually a positive uh, colloquial term. Hmm. So this seems like things that are done after the fact. Um, how can this be used then to – I mean, is this just an analytics tool maybe after? Uh, or, or can it be used to, to predict certain um, attitudes or even actions that may occur? I think the best way you get at prediction is the same way that, that, that people have been doing predictions for the longest time, and that's persistent research, persistent monitoring. Um, you can't come in and expect to spend a week looking at, a, at any subject online uh, or any community online and expect, to, hey, I, I, can, I can reasonably come up with an idea for how these people are going to behave or how this particular subject is going to behave. Uh, that's why we still get surprised by things that happen online. Uh, Arab Spring is a good example. Um, that was that was arguably something that no one saw coming, particularly um, offline. And then the online reaction and the online spread and the use of social media technologies uh, to, to to get those stories out. Um, even Andy Carvin, uh, when he was still at NPR, uh, and may have been the first person to actually pick up social media activity related uh, to what was going on in Tunisia. First off. Uh, he was just responding to stuff that was happening in real time, um, and and it just so happened that, that he was able to do that because he had news feeds or or Twitter feeds set up in his Hootsuite or his TweetDeck um, tools, uh, and he started to see patterns in data that was coming through there. Right, so multiple uh, Twitter users that he was following using a hashtag, uh, you know, uh, Tunisia or something like that, and then those hash those those hashes becoming more and more popular, uh, and, and containing tweets like, uh, the police are firing at us, you know, that kind of stuff. So I don't know about prediction. I think prediction is, is a, is a pretty soft science right now for anything. Um, but, but really when it comes to social media, we, you know, we can get pretty good at, at, at real time analysis. Okay. Well, and, and what's really, really, really fascinating, I think, Chris, and, and something that you've spoken about before is that clearly sort of behaviors and feelings drive sentiment online, but then that in turn, it, it becomes cyclic because that in turn will drive action, right? And and the Andy Carvin example is a great one because I, I believe that you have told me that, that that turned around into providing aid for people. And so it became sort of a people going to um, online media and then using that 
to go back to people. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean, and, and, and you know, I think real time is probably a, a, a better way to think about that, right, than, than prediction. Because in real time, if you're able to say, hey, as, as Andy was able to do, to say, like, hey, you know, all of you people who are talking about organizing um, on this particular street corner, um, uh, you know, Andy was seeing other tweets from people that were on that street quarter that said, "Hey, there's 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 police over here. We don't want to organize here. It's it's a uh, it's a potential ambush." So, you know, from from the distribution of aid all the way to coordinating protests uh, or supporting protests. I mean, being being in the middle of that real time uh, uh, environment, uh, social media environment, you can have immediate effects on on changing behavior. Right. Nice. Does it easy. work in other? Does it work in other languages? Uh, on Twitter or yeah, or? like uh, for example, you know, Arab Spring. You know, what if they tweet in Arabic or or you know, Farsi or whatever? Yeah. Can it pick so, up those? Pa- so I it mean, depends on what tool you're using to look at at Twitter in that example, right? So Andy. Andy d- doesn't speak. Andy Carvin doesn't speak a word of Arabic. I mean, he knows a couple of you know he knows a couple of phrases now. But he was seeing this because um, he was following a number of like local citizen journalists on Twitter who tweeted both in English and in Arabic. Um, so that that was for that situation. It was it was helpful. And then when he saw something that in Arabic that he didn't understand, Andy would then retweet that that tweet and say, "Can anyone translate this for for him?" And by virtue of the crowds that followed him on Twitter, he would have a translation in about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, if not sooner. Um, uh, but, but there's also, you know, Twitter itself, uh, I believe, is now supported uh, by a Bing translator algorithm. So if you're actually looking at tweets directly on Twitter.com uh, in, a, in, a, in a foreign language, there should be a translation option at the bottom of that tweet. Like you can drill into a specific tweet and at the very bottom, like it'll say, you know, translate tweet and it'll, it should bring that up. But I don't know how many languages it actually does that for right now. Yeah. I, you know, I think it does Spanish. I think it does a couple of, you know, you know, French, some easy to recognize languages, but, but Arabic in particular is very complicated to, yeah. uh, to work out. Yeah, the the other problem that you'd have is like, for example, like you brought up before, when people are like, "Batman, the new movie was the shit," right? Mm-hmm. Like that is positive, but Batman was shit, is is not. I'm sure there's tons of that for Arabic too. Like y- you know, Arab Spring. If you read that, you'd think, "What is that? Like an Indian summer?" But it's actually you know not what it's. So if it translates into different things using different translators, like if Google Translate and Bing Translate and an actual human translator translate those into different words, you don't have a trend anymore. You have a bunch of random data that doesn't sound the same. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I mean, and even, even it's really funny, too, because there's even a, a, a kind of an online-only language for Arabic now called Arabisi, where some, um, some letters and phrases that don't translate between Arabic and English are represented by special characters and numbers. Uh, which completely throws off any type of manual or, or automatic translation. Uh, and, 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 and you're right, even in that case, what's the context behind that? You know, if you right. try, to, try to get if you try to get a machine to help translate that for you, it's going to come back with something weird that maybe has no bearing or no meaning on what the person actually said. Yeah, yeah, like Mubarak didn't take his vitamins today. Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, like some of the examples you just gave, that was great. People being able to join together, maybe either in supporting each other or helping others or even organizing a protest. But it sounds like this can also be used for very nefarious purposes, uh, the, the same type of mentality um, to, to maybe even um, instigate mob activity or to affect a whole market in the country. It sounds like the, the, same, the same type of thinking can be used that way. Oh heck yeah! Um, I I I think um, I love the I love the possibility of using social media to to you know um, inspire action offline. Um, you know for for whatever purpose, whether it's uh, hey you know let's use Foursquare and put a hundred dollar Amazon card as a re- as a reward for everyone that checks into the embassy down the street. Uh, and, and, you know, and when they check in, they use hashtag topple the dictator or whatever it happens to be. Um, I, I love, I love the, the, the ability to be able to do stuff like that. And I think, I think, uh, really savvy, 
really savvy u- uh, use of social media can result in in behavior like that, you know, because those things are built into the the technologies and the tools. I use Foursquare as an example. That's a location based social media platform, um, but it's 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 super simple to go and buy that. Uh, that that merchant package and offer some type of reward uh, to people who will say like oh heck yeah I'll 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 go out and scream a little bit in front of an embassy if I can download this free Amazon gift card or a cell phone card or something that's like that. So f- that's so funny. I can just see Kim Jong Un standing in this middle of this huge room, being like, "Who manages our Foursquare profile? <laughs> Feed him to the dogs." <laughs> if you can find him, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, because that, that to me is the interesting part. Like, you know, in our industry, we focus so much on social media, the dangers of it, because people put their whole lives online. So it's easy to, to get doxxed or to find, uh, you know, with, with the weakness of security questions being, you know, where did you go to high school? What's your mother's maiden name? Those things are very easy to find online on most people. Um, and it gets easier each, each day as more social media applications open up and people are using them to put their whole lives online and they may not put it all in one social media application they may spread it across three or four but when you when you dock someone then you can create a a, a profile on them but now we're looking at a whole different side of social media which which could be just as dangerous or maybe even worse because you're, you're you're you could be creating a whole type of mob mentality just from how you word your your tweets or how you uh, put things on Facebook or um, how you use Foursquare, like you said, for checking in. Um, so it seems like like this is another avenue that really should be analyzed a lot more to see how people could be protected from being influenced by it. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I, it, 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 it's so funny because these these tools and technologies, you know, because they're free, people are, are very quick to go and adopt them and play around with them, and, you know, find in, innovative uses of them. But you know, because they're free, they don't realize that 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 even though they're they're not paying, uh, then they're probably the product. Uh, <laughs> so so what that means is, is that all of these tools are, are they're 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 logging activity, they're logging profiles, they're logging what types of pictures that get uploaded to each one, uh, geolocation data. There's so much data that people surrender to social media that that make it really really simple if someone can go and get access to that data. I mean, Foursquare is a great example. Foursquare has a merchant solution uh, that you can buy into that will enable you, based on what kind of business that you've got or you say you have, uh, that will enable you to see all of the check-in data for people around a certain area of your business, right? So, so what's the uh, data that's collected during check-in? Yeah, so it's stuff like uh, it's stuff like sentiment. Like, okay, someone checks into a burger joint and says, "I love the burger here," or "I love the shakes here." Uh, all of that stuff is captured in the Foursquare dashboard. Now, if you're a burger, a brick and mortar burger joint, and and you're trying to compete with McDonald's, uh, it'll see everyone that's that's checking in over at McDonald's, and you can directly target all of those people and send them a special. Hey, come to my burger joint, and we'll give you, you know, ten percent off your next your next order. Uh, or, hey, I noticed that uh, a ton of people have taken pictures of how unclean the restrooms are in, uh, in, oh. in, in this McDonald's, you know. So, so let's stop there for a second. So you can buy a merchant package that allows you to communicate directly without solicitation to anyone who says, in my area, I went to this burger joint, and now I could just say, I want all these people to get my free ad. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. In essence, and how much does this merchant package cost? I'm not sure. They actually, it, it's tailored for each use. Um, so, you know, smaller businesses with only one one location, of course, will will be a little bit more affordable than you know national chains. So, so I get on there and say I'm a tiny burger joint with one location in the middle of DC, and then I can start sending links out to people. What when they click it, it downloads malware on their cell phones. Exactly. Or even better, think about it like this. The way that Foursquare has been changing its uh, its app lately is um, it's getting smarter, so it recognizes where you happen to be in the places that you've checked in in the past. So a good example, I love to check into bars. Why? Because I go to bars a lot. Um, so anytime I'm around a bar now and I've got my Foursquare app open, it says, hey, do four. You happen to be three blocks away from uh, this bar, Bilbo Baggins, and it's got a special on a certain type of beer. Um, here's an ad that gets served up for, for a discount on that beer. Boom. 
Um, so it, it doesn't even require the person to check into that place anymore. It's, it's, it's all of that data based on, on my interactions and the ways that I've been using the app are, are being transmitted back to whoever is using those that, or, bu- or buying ads into that system. But not right? just that. It's also tracking your GPS location. Exactly. And it's all very 1984. Oh, totally. Right. So, so now you've got your phone on. You've got Foursquare open. And it's saying do four is at this longitude and this latitude. And around there, there's three bars that, that have ads that they just paid us for. So we're going to serve up these ads to him because it knows your geolocation. Exactly. Which means if I know your user name, if I can find that out because you put it on your Facebook or other place, I, I and and I was able to access those records. I mean, depending on what you're saying, the merchant account holds. You can actually geolocate down to probably within a few feet of where target people are. Oh yeah, without a doubt. And even and think about think about this too. You know, people who are are checking into places, they're often taking a picture of their food, right? Or, or they're taking a picture of who they're with or whatever. And those pictures contain georeference data as well, right? That you can download directly from the app uh, or the dashboard. Oh, there's just, it, like, there's just so many security implications. Of it's like I want to throw my phone in the trash right now after I just <laughs> yeah. you know? well, it's, It seems cool. Um it seems cool that you can do that. I mean, it's so funny because I was like, wow, that's really great marketing. And Chris is like, here's how I can sort of screw everyone who follows this really simple, <laughs> yeah. like, very convenient thing. But that's, it's, it's so true, though, because it is like, wow, you know, as a, the businessman in me is like, that's so convenient. And the hacker and Chris is like, that is so easy to get people to do something that is so bad for them. So it makes perfect sense because, man, you could you could easily get folks who, I mean, I'm trying to think of, we're you know we're getting malware on general people's cell phones. That's all fine and good, but you could target people who like. What if you know all the workers from the French embassy eat at some patisserie in Washington D.C. and you could get those people to get malware on their phones, and then those phones go into areas where you know before they check them in anyway. Um, some people probably break that rule and leave it on their desk, and you've got. You know, malware that activates the microphone or something like or, that. Or what about you? You go around the Pentagon and there's like 30 Starbucks that you can imagine all the Pentagon employees are visiting before they hit work. Yeah, and totally. you serve them up a piece of malware, and then, like you said, you're turning on microphones and other things on their devices yeah, while they're yeah. sitting in secret meetings. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I'm 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 hoping that security protocol dictate dictates you put your phone into a safe that's, you know, lead and where it gets no signal before you jump into a quick meeting. But, I mean, there's probably tons of times when people forget about that or they're like, you know what, I'm going to get an important text and I don't care about this stupid thing, you know. Or it's sitting on their desk when they're on the phone. Yeah. Maybe they're not in a super important meeting, but they get a phone call from a super important person and now the microphone's on and and that phone call can be listened into or recorded. Mm-hmm. Well, think about. I mean, the Pentagon's such an exa- it's such an interesting example in and of itself. So I used to work at the Pentagon, and 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 uh, it, there's so much that happens within that bizarre, you know, defense industrial environment that uh, that even even if it's not a secret meeting, even if it's not happening, uh, you know, behind closed doors someplace, there's so many places in 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 that in that area that folks talk about sensitive information uh, because they think once they get behind the doors. Uh, everything's fine, right? And I mean, you can take your cell phone out into the courtyard uh, of the Pentagon, or even even through a lot of the halls, um, and 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 you'd be amazed at what you could pick up just listening. So so you're right, yeah. The ability to the ability to get that malware downloaded for someone who, who's literally just gonna have it have it on their person as they're walking through the halls. Uh, you, there's no telling the type of stuff uh, that you could you could pick up with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was in the Pentagon just a couple years ago for a meeting. And I tried to take a picture, and I had like 30 people telling me that they were going to confiscate my phone if I took a picture. Yet yesterday, Dufour, you and I were in North Carolina or or Monday training together, Mm -hmm. and we did that little search, and we saw a guy who was in the Pentagon taking pictures with his girlfriend. (laughs) Yep. Right? Yeah, exactly. And then tweeting it. You know, oh, I got a picture inside the Pentagon, you know, kind of thing. So all you need is one guy like that who's, you know, willing to, to break those rules and then publicly say it. To click on your little malware Foursquare ad because you paid a couple hundred dollars for your merchant account, and now you're feeding up everyone within that geolocation a nice little URL that says yeah. "click me." 
Exactly. I mean, and think about think about all the people that go in and out of there too. They do they do official tours sometimes. I mean, this is one building. You can do it around the yeah. White House. There's 300 restaurants right around the White House. Oh uh, God, you, yeah. You, you can do that around any a, a corporation. Forget government. You can do that around Microsoft, around whatever. Mm -hmm. Any corporation you'd want to infiltrate. It just seems like such a. And we're just talking about one piece of social media here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the 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 corporate and then the private sector implications are probably even worse because think about think about how lax security is. You know, for for even for even many small businesses that do policies like a bring your own device to work type thing, right? So uh, people bring their own cell phones because they don't want to have two cell phones, uh, and they use that cell phone as their as their work phone and their personal phone. Well. You know, those phones are sitting around their desk. They're sitting in meetings. I mean, how many meetings have you been to where everyone's got their phones in there because they're tired of listening to some talking about something stupid? Um, but but whatever he's talking about may be important to somebody else, a competitor or what have you. And, uh, you know, if they've checked in at one of those, you know, at the, at the sub shop down the street uh, because of an ad that they got served on Foursquare and they downloaded that malware – they're in that meeting, and that phone is recording everything that the guy's saying, and it's getting transmitted back to a competitor someplace. You know, that's that's all within the realm of the possible. I mean, I'm surprised that that we actually haven't heard more stories of of uh, of people actually conducting like that level of of, of espionage. I, I'm I'm surprised. I mean, I'm I'm sure that we will right after this podcast. <laughs> Unfortunately, but I you're mean, welcome criminals. Yeah, yeah, I, it's just mm -hmm. it's it's kind of scary. You know, it's kind of scary when you think and this is just one avenue of social media. I mean, we're talking, you know, you, the the amount of Facebook on cell phones and that's probably what still is that still the largest social media network in the world is Facebook. Yeah, Facebook is definitely the largest social media network on the planet. It's it's also the most visited website on the planet. So really? yeah, uh, so and the reason that is is it's not just people that are going to to you know socially network with their friends. People are consuming internet content more and more through their Facebook stream. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And that's interesting yeah. both from a business perspective. Just thinking about where and how to market, right? How important that is. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, think about how many websites that you visit nowadays that have like a little Facebook like button somewhere yeah. on them, right? So if you click that like button, you're giving permission to Facebook uh, and that website to blast all of that website's content into your Facebook stream. Uh, so and and no one's no one's paying attention to little terms and conditions, you know, that, that may pop up with that, but but you're essentially granting that website or whoever owns that website the ability to look at your Facebook stream and determine where they want to drop the, the latest headline or the latest story. Uh, and, and then think about all the things you can attach to that, all the cookies that you can attach to a story that gets dropped into your Facebook feed. I mean, it's really, really simple now to have a, a third or fourth party website, uh, you know, and which seems totally innocuous, be a provider of, of spam or other type of malware that, that, uh, that gets into your Facebook stream. Uh. I tell you, every time I look at social media, it just gets scarier and scarier. <laughs> I mean, what, what's the what's the protection like for that? Let's say that Foursquare thing. I mean, besides the obvious is like don't use it. But you know, let's say it's not a choice. Let's say for business people want to use it or have to use it, then what's the protection? Uh, well, you know, I mean, a lot of it is um, a lot of it is just kind of awareness, right? So, so how you use things. I mean, I mean when I when I use Foursquare, because I love Foursquare, I think it's I, I think the game aspect of Foursquare is a lot of fun. I like unlocking badges and competing with people to become mayors of places and stuff like that. I think it's a blast. Um, but uh, I also understand that that using my use of Foursquare creates a certain pattern of life, um, uh, and and now I have since. Uh, disconnected uh, Foursquare from my other social media profiles so that it doesn't automatically populate um, where I am and what I'm doing on my Facebook uh, uh, page. There's actually a, a page on Facebook that kind of connect, connects where you've been on a map. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the reasons I don't connect that anymore. But also, I, I, you know, I use it kind of a little bit more offensively and kind of think about it from terms of well, if someone thinks that I'm checked in here, then I'm not home. So maybe they're robbing me or something like that. Well, I've also used I've also used other uh, geolocation services like Scavenger or what have you to say that I'm in two places at the same time. So I'm creating doubt as to where I'm really checked into. Yeah, I think you guys have mentioned that um, in the past when we've, we've gotten together. You talk a lot about digital exhaust, and the question always seems to come up, well, you know, how can I completely 
disappear online and, 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 you know, there's lots of discussions about whether or not that's possible, but I know in the past um, you guys have talked about creating digital exhaust, like you said, in a more offensive manner to kind of, um, I don't know, direct people in, in a different, uh, along a different route if they're looking for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I love it's, it's the honeypot theory, right? So if you put right. something out there that looks that that is that is purposely built to be infiltrated, then you can monitor who it is that's that's following you or infiltrating you. Um, and and there's a lot of great ways to do that. It's it's one of the best techniques that I've ever heard of is is for each one of your social media profiles. Use your real name, but spell it differently. On, on every one of them. And so when you, you know, get a suspicious email or something, you look at your name and you see that, oh, it's, it's do for spelled with the E and not with the four or, or fully spelled out. Now you know that which one of your social networks was compromised or which one was, was, was under surveillance. And you can use, you can use that to, to either lock that down or just follow the rabbit trail back and, and, and figure out, okay, who, who's, who's, who's messing with me on this particular social network. Yeah, I actually do that. And I do it with uh, postal mail as well. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a really easy way to tell when you get junk mail because you're like, who, you know, it's like, who the heck is that? And so it's funny because there's some that I stopped using literally in the 90s and I'm still getting letters like, this is for so-and-so. And I'm like, yep. wow, that company sold my contact info again? I mean, <laughs> where did they even get it? You yeah, know, friend, exactly. Friendster? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what the heck is this from? Friendster. MySpace. So it's it's unbelievable, and it, you know it's kind of funny. You mentioned before looking at where people are checked in and trying to figure that out. I I gave a talk at DefCon uh, on behalf of this sort of social engineering group here as well, uh, and one of the things that I did was people would like uh, all these engineers, these these top secret cleared engineers. They wouldn't tell me where they worked. Some of them, uh, very few actually, but some of them wouldn't. So what I did is I just found their Yelp profile using their email and other contact info, and it was like they're all checked into like Starbucks, Burger King, all these different places, and it's like, okay, well, these are all in Conroe, Texas. So this guy's in Conroe, Texas, regardless of whether or not he's going to tell me that, uh, or he goes there a lot for something. So there's something in Conroe, Texas, and you, you might even be able to find a secondary location, like, oh, whenever he's in... The Austin area, he's going to this place, this place, and this place. So his office was probably walking distance from those things. It makes me think of a tool um, called Creepy. That's uh, C R E E dot P Y. It's a geolocation uh, OSI tool. So it, it takes things like your Flickr, your Twitter, and your Instagram account, and it strips the geolocation data from what you post. Cool. And then puts it on a Google map. So, I, I mean, even if, even if you got like fake, you know, names or profiles, if I got your username, we can geolocate where you go. And that alone to me is dangerous, right? I know every yeah, morning definitely. you go to this Starbucks, you go to this gym, this is your office, you're here for this long. You know, you go to this location after work, you go to this bar, you eat dinner here. And you can start building, you do this for a few days or weeks or months, and you can start seeing a pattern of where people go, how long they spend there. And um, that, that, that can really open up a world of, of pain for, for those who use those, uh, use those uh, online social media tools too much. That oh, sounds yeah. really interesting. That's so dangerous. I mean, obviously, people who are well-known can't ever check into anything anywhere for any reason. <laughs> ever. <laughs> Ever well, but I mean, I mean, even think about like though you know you talk about celebrity use or, or even well known uh, you know business people that have been using. And granted, I mean the the, the percentage of, of people that are using Foursquare is, is a fraction of of even folks that are using Twitter or Facebook. Um, but just even just Twitter, you know, where you're 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 taking a picture of something. There's there's data in that picture that gets uploaded to Twitter uh, that you can strip out. Uh, I don't know if he creepy does it or not, but I mean, you know, Chris, you even showed us it at a couple of times how to get that that uh, that lat long coordinate out of a picture that gets uploaded to yeah. Snapchat or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and now and Facebook. This is interesting about Facebook. Even though they strip it off of what's public, they keep it in their back end databases. So with API searches, you can you can find the geolocation. Mm -hmm. uh, data inside pictures, or if someone's using a mobile app to post things to Facebook, it ge it puts a geolocation data on an album or on on a post. 
Interesting. Yeah. So there's a. It's just when I think about social media, I always. I mean, we use it, right? Just like you, we use it in our company. Uh, we have Facebook pages for our company and our dot org, and 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 we use uh, Twitter, obviously, um, to get the message out there. Um, but you know, you know, I think uh, like what we always promote, you know, using educated thought process to try to figure out how you're going to use it may keep you safe, but whew, I don't know. The more I hear, the more it's like, I'm not sure if there's any way to keep truly safe. <laughs> well, I mean, it, you, you're totally right. It all comes back to training. You know, we, we, uh, we, we have a program called secure cog that, that, uh, educates organizations about how to, how to best consider a cyber attack, right? Well, you know, one of the, one of the ways that we define a cyber attack is, is someone who's messing with you on social media. Um, it, it, that may fall into what's traditionally known as reputation management or a reputation attack or a brand attack, but it's the same thing, right? It's, it's someone who is using a piece of technology uh, to, to do something nefarious with your information, whether it's public information or private information. And, and, and people can, can do some pretty simple things to, to still use social networks and social media, whether personally or professionally, um, and, and stay secure, or at least make themselves appear so secure that an attacker will move on to the next person who's easier to crack. Right, low-hanging fruit. Right. Yeah, that's a sad way to teach, but we do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah don't be the low-hanging fruit. Maybe they'll go for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible, right? You always want to be so next to the, the fat guy with a broken leg when a bear is facing him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like it's like anything, you know. With yeah, the the fat guy with the broken leg, exactly. But I mean, it's like you know, you're walking around in a neighborhood at night, and you you know, somebody says, "Give me your wallet," and you go, "Hell no!" And you start yelling at them. They're like, "All right, well, there's going to be some other dumbass walking through this neighborhood in about half an hour, so I'll just wait for them." You know, <laughs> it's not worth it. Man. So, Chris, can you talk a little bit about how White Canvas and you are using all of your superpowers for good? <laughs> superpowers, that's great. Uh, yeah, Dufour's like a superhero, man. Have you seen his hair? Uh, I, it's I have, awesome. I saw it just the other day when he came back from Texas and we were training together. It was You got me on a bad day, too, Chris, because yeah. was, it was raining out there. I was a little kinky. I had, I had a bit of an afro going on. <laughs> I'm serious, y'all. If you haven't if you haven't found a picture of Chris Dufour, look up the hair. It's it's outstanding. <laughs> yeah, just you wait. I've 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 I'm getting ready to getting ready to go on a cruise here pretty soon. And and my wife was just like, yeah, let's do away with the superhero hair because no, you're not gonna have, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have access to um uh, uh, uh you know conditioner and shampoo where we're going. <laughs> I don't like to look at you like that. <laughs> But yes, to your question, Michelle, um, some of the stuff that we do is, is uh, you know, again, training and technology. We, I, I, I just mentioned a, a training program we have called Secure Cog, uh, and uh, Secure Cog is, is really kind of our perspective on how to secure your cognition, because uh, we think, uh, we think, again, kind of going back to what y'all talk about in social engineering, um, uh, we think being able to secure a person. Uh, and making a person more secure themselves versus spending more time on how to make your firewall bigger and, and better is going to yield a lot more results in the future. Uh, so getting people to understand uh, and, and recognize the telltale signs of when someone is, is following your digital exhaust, uh, when you're getting a friend request from someone on Facebook that you don't know, you don't accept it, um, uh, or you create an account on LinkedIn, a professional account where you'll connect with anybody and then you watch what types of people uh, that you've never heard of, you don't know, are connecting with you and where they're coming from and what kind of activity, what are they looking at on your profile. Uh, SecureCog is all about learning how, how to secure a person as part of an organization or personally to do those types of things and not just stay safe on social media, but also collectively stay safe as an organization. So that that kind of like leads us to like a shameless plug. I think we should do a shameless plug do for. I love it. Because we're we got this panel coming up at South by Southwest. Yeah. Uh first time I'm ever even going to that and speaking there with you guys with yeah. the White Canvas group. Uh on that topic what you just said, you know, why humans are are you know the training for we need to give the humans instead of uh strengthening our firewalls. Uh we're not saying we don't need to strengthen our firewalls, but we need to put as much effort and time into 
strengthening our human firewall over our, our physical firewalls. Absolutely, absolutely. That's uh, and it's that's good. That's going to be a good. That's going to be a good time. I'm glad you decided to dane us with your your awesome presence, Mister Hadnagy. Yeah, that's I that. didn't say no to the Dufour. The su- <laughs> it was the superhero hair. I think that, you know, it was a truth lasso or something, and I was forced into it. <laughs> yeah, but um, for yeah, for anyone that may be listening that, uh, that that can't make it to South by Southwest and wants to participate, uh, the panel is actually going down at at 9.30 Central Time on Monday, March the 10th. Uh, and if you've got a question about anything cybersecurity related or related to securing humans uh, from cyber attack or related to reputation management or social engineering, um, you can use the hashtag uh, SecureCog, that's S-E-C-U-R-E-C-O-G, uh, to send us a question. And if you've got questions, we'll, we'll read them out in front of the in front of the panel, and I think that panel will be recorded, chopped up by South by Southwest, and put online later. So maybe your question your question will be answered by a social engineering luminary like uh, Mr. Chris Adnagy <laughs> and Mr. John and our other friend Nicole, and all <laughs> somehow organized by the Master Dufour. I am the puppet master. Yeah, I I, I don't envy your job. I'd much uh, rather have my job in this in this role. It's it's it's, it's it can be difficult sometimes, but uh, that's why I deal with only cool people like yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, well, you know, you're going to try to organize two strong D's and a and a really strong S. I think she might be. So I don't know how you're gonna you're gonna do that. No, so that that's kind of cool, and um, and it, it's it's interesting to me because um, before I met you guys, the only time we ever talked about security and social media and these type of topics is when we were talking to someone else in our field you know someone else in the social engineering professional social engineering realm doing uh se pen testing or things like that so you guys uh, even though we're very very similar you guys come at it from a completely different angle because you're looking more at the data sets and how those data sets can be used to 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 strengthen or or help educate uh so i always found that to to be kind of like an interesting mix between us and how how this works? Yeah, I think I think I, and we've been we've been training now. I mean, you've been training with John and Tim here at White Canvas Group for longer than I've been here. But uh, um, I, I, I definitely think that that that's what makes our kind of joint engagements a lot more fun and, and engaging because because of the perspectives that we bring to the table. So um, let's keep that up, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I think we should. I think we should. And then somehow we get into places like South by Southwest, which is. The, I don't know. It's just like one of the, probably the craziest speaking venues I think we can think of doing. I mean, I yeah, I think that's going to be an insane fun time. Having been several times myself and and never having spoken before, uh, so this will be a little bit different for me. But uh, just just uh, there's uh, there's uh, just hydrate, man. You got to hydrate and you got to get a lot of sleep before you go out because yeah, you. Well, <laughs> not, there's not much sleep happening because you you got like Monday you you, you got us doing the panel and then. Uh, thanks to you, now I got a book signing there, and then you, thanks to you, we got this book launch party. Which is, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It just seems like everything on earth is going to happen all in one day. That day is going to be crazy town. That day's um, never going to end. Yeah. So. yeah. And it's, it's it's funny too because that same day, one of my favorite comic book authors is actually giving a talk uh, that day as well. So I'm going to try and I'm try and ambush him and get him to come to the party later. Hopefully not the the same time. Oh no, no, he's later in the day. Good, good, good. Yeah, well, I hope that our speech at nine thirty in the morning will, you know, have at least one or two people there since it's going to be so early. Yeah, I think you'll be surprised. I mean, I mean, uh, the the early sessions I kind of like a little bit more because the really like like the people that really want to be there will will come. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and and we're actually at the Sheraton instead of uh, the main Austin Convention Center. So the Austin Convention Center is really just people kind of like bop around from room to room just to see what's interesting. But uh, at the satellite campuses, they're kind of organized by topic. So I think most of the the security and cyber related stuff is going to be going on at the Sheraton Austin. Uh, so we'll get we'll get people that are just like you know hardcore interested in in our stuff and our talk. So that'll be great. So what else does um, White Canvas have going on nowadays? I mean, give give you some time here to. Kind of promo what you guys are doing. 
Uh, well, I kind of mentioned like our two big things right now, uh, secure cog training, uh, which is a two day course where we, uh, uh, we customize the different types of clients on. And again, just like I said, the melding of the technical security with, uh, uh rep reputation based and brand security. Uh, we spend a lot of time actually analyzing things like brand jacking, uh, and how social media can be used to, uh, brand jack someone and kind of embarrass different types of folks online and how that actually hurts someone's bottom line. Uh, so that's, that's a, that's a big thing. We actually just launched securecog.com. Uh, if you're, if any of your listeners want to, want to find some more information, uh, feel free to check that out. That would actually be that topic that you just mentioned would be a really interesting topic, uh, to discuss maybe in another podcast because brand jacking to me, um, it's like a whole nother layer, right? So we're not uh, now we're getting out of social engineering for a minute, but wow, what a damage that can do to to an individual. I know there's a lot of people that I was uh, reading some articles online who people will go and get a Twitter account that is maybe one letter different and put the mm -hmm. picture of the actual star on there, start tweeting things or saying things, and people don't tell the difference, and it gets attributed to them. Oh yeah. Yeah, my I, the brain jacking is kind of like a, a, a personal favorite subject for me because I, I, I find it so fascinating. Some of the examples uh, and, and cases that have happened in in, in the, the biggest one, uh, it probably that folks would remember most recently was BP Global PR on Twitter. Oh yeah, like fake. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, and that, it was actually the reason why Twitter now has a policy on if you're creating a fake account, you have to label it as parody. Um, but but that whole that whole case study is is just fascinating and how it unfolded and, and even how how BP's response to it was was very careful and measured and and uh, and how that gets misconstrued in the press a lot. But uh, I, I love brand jack. I could talk about brand jacking for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so they can check out securecog dot com. Securecog dot com. Um, we're also working on uh, on an alpha version of that video monitoring platform that I talked about with Dark Knight Rises. It's called VizSense. Um, that that's not ready for launch yet, but uh, it, VizSense is 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 going to be specifically built uh, to measure YouTube uh, and the viral trajectory of YouTube videos. So how effective videos get shared, uh, where they're going, uh, and hopefully as a as a mechanism for people to use to help plan. YouTube video campaigns, uh, whether they're, they've got ad campaigns or pay-per-click campaigns or advertising, that kind of thing. Uh, so so we're, we're hopefully going to launch, uh, have a demo for that available at South by Southwest just to kind of show folks. And then uh, we'll be looking for some, some beta test users after that. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And, of course, you've got your main website, whitecanvasgroup.com. Yep, yep. Feel free to check that out. And a lot of people, um, there's two questions we usually ask guests. Um, for, first, uh, if they want to follow you personally, Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Uh, you can actually follow me on Twitter at, at do four. It's at d u and the number four. Um, I got in early, so one of those little three letter <laughs> three letter Twitter accounts. I'm never letting that go. Yeah, watch out! And you just hear that good poor guy that got himself hacked with the one. Letter. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! yeah. Terrible. Yep. But uh, you can follow me there. You can also I'm, – I'm the guy behind the at SecureCog uh, uh, Twitter account as well. Uh, and we, we usually use that, that Twitter account to tweet a lot of uh, links to a lot of really interesting cybersecurity articles and stuff like that. And we, re, we, we retweet, retweet, retweet <laughs> and curate <laughs> a lot of that content. So, uh, and then maybe provide some, uh, uh, some commentary here and there. So that, that account's, that, that account's uh, at SecureCog uh, and should be easy to find. And then, uh, uh, and then another question. Something we didn't, I didn't prep you with beforehand. So this is off, kind of off the cuff. But awesome. Uh, we have a lot of people love to read. Any good mm. books on this topics, or anything that uh, you would suggest as far as uh, someone heard some things here about uh, brand jacking or or the social media dangers? Are there any books that you say, wow, this is the this is the book you should read on these topics? I tell you, the best one that I've read recently that just continues to blow my mind that I keep referring back to is a book called Digital Assassination. Um, and it's by uh, a guy named Torenzano and a partner, uh, Davis, Torenzano and Davis. Um, but Torenzano actually is, is one of the lead guys at the Torenzano Group in, in New York City, and they do reputation management consulting for clients. Uh, and, and Davis, I think, is a researcher at George Mason University on, on the subject of brand jacking and stuff like that. But, but digital assassination is all about how to spot um, attacks to your online reputation, uh, whether it's 
it's a ta- it's it's false product reviews that are happening on Yelp or Amazon or something like that, uh, all the way up to examples of brand jacking. And a lot of the stories that they have in that book are fascinating. Uh, we refer back to that book all the time, and there's a lot of really good practical advice on how to defend uh, uh, against a reputation attack that we've we've kind of taken to heart and built into our own training. Excellent, excellent, Chris. This has really been interesting. A uh, great topic and really fitting. And um, I know that we're going to awesome. Well, thanks for having again. me on, man. I, uh, yeah, I love you know I love to talk. So uh, well, well, well played, sir. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. This has been great. Um, so uh, we got uh, we got your websites. We'll put them on the show notes. People can start following you on Twitter, and uh, I'm sure we'll do this again. Maybe we'll do the brand jacking topic next time. Awesome. That'd be good times. Thanks, man. Hey, no problem. Good talking to y'all. Jordan, good to meet you, man. Likewise. Take care. Thanks, Chris. Cool. Y'all take it easy. Bye-bye. Well, another great guest, as usual. We seem to always do that, but I think the topic was quite fitting. And uh, I had to mute a little bit. You made me laugh, Jordan, when you're sitting there thinking about how great marketing tool that is, and I'm like, let's hack the world using it. <laughs> yeah, let's let's make something break. Yeah, it's like, okay, not yeah. where I was going with it. Yeah. As he's talking, that's all I can think about. I was, oh my gosh, like this, you know, I mean, we're, every every month you hear something, you know, oh, this new exploit in Apple or, or Android's vulnerable as heck, and you're thinking, okay, well, everyone's either got an iPhone or an, or an Android phone nowadays. Um this would be a, a great way to serve that up to the masses and just see what you get. I, I, I think so. It's scary, though. You know, it's scary. I mean, you hear these things all the time, and, like, people say their phones are everywhere. And people get worried about their webcams getting hacked on their laptops. Well, your phones are probably in more places than your laptops are, mm-hmm. you know, intimate places. So I'd be extra cautious with that. What a What a scary topic, if you ask me. Well, along that lines, another great month gone by. What have we got going on? Anything else we need to talk about, Michelle, before we before we say our goodbyes? No, yeah, I think we're I think we're good. I think we've got most of the important stuff covered. And if not, we'll cover it next month. Most of the important stuff. <laughs> I think we did too. So um, maybe next month we'll be graced by uh, Dave and and Ping again. We'll have our full team back, but. Thanks to Jordan and uh, Michelle for popping in here and helping us out with the podcast. Of course, you can always check us out on social-engineer.org or social-engineer.com. Our Twitter accounts are Human Hacker, and the corporate account is SOC Engineer Inc. If you're an IRC user, you can jump into our channel at uh, irc.freenode.net, channel social-engineer. Thanks again for listening, guys, and we'll see you next month. Peace. My heart is gone I don't go The past gives way To a cold winter field The ground below Hard as steel Beyond the hill A distant song But that hill keeps going on and on My heart is gone
can't seem to recall any given name. I see the footprints, how they come, how they go. Was that only a moment or many years ago? My heart is gone. Gone.